Yeah, baby. 506 now. News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. You can help us do that always at 888-630-9625. 888-630-WMAL. Joe Biden has told a lot of lies in his political career. He whipped out yet another doozy today as he was asked about all of his many contacts with the Biden family's business associates. He said, it's just a bunch of lies. That's never happened. Here's New York Post reporter Stephen Nelson getting in the rare question to Joe Biden today. Uh, there's polling by the Associated Press that shows that almost 70 percent of Americans, including 40 percent of Democrats, believe that you acted either illegally or unethically in regards to your family's business interests. Can you explain to the Americans, uh, to Americans admit this impeachment inquiry, why you interacted with so many of your son and brother's foreign business associates? I'm not going to comment that I did not, and it's just a bunch of lies. You didn't interact with many of their lies. business associates? I did not. There's what? lies. Chaos in there. No no meaningful follow-ups on that subject. Of course, it deserves a ton of follow-ups. So we'll follow up right here. James Lynch joins us now. He's an investigative reporter for The Daily Caller, and he joins us on the phone. Hello, James. Hey, Ben. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's address what the president said today. The president said that it is a lie that he interacted with his family's business associates. What's the truth? Yeah, so the truth is that Joe Biden has interacted with uh, Hunter and James Biden's uh, former business associates. We know this from testimony delivered by Devin Archer, and we know this from uh, White House visitor logs from the Obama administration when Joe Biden was vice president. And we know this from new documents released by the House Ways and Means Committee yesterday provided by uh, the IRS whistleblowers. And the documents show that uh, Joe Biden was emailing Hunter Biden's former business associate and accountant, Eric Schwerin, and that the pair exchanged 54 emails one-on-one that Joe Biden sent through his pseudonym, Robin Ware. So we have plenty of evidence that Joe Biden spoke with his son's business associates on multiple occasions, uh, not just the not just the uh, the friends of Hunter Biden, but also the foreign business associates. We know that Joe Biden attended a dinner featuring Burisma executive Vadim Posharsky. We also know that Joe Biden attended a meeting after his vice presidency with business associates from Chinese energy firm CEFC. And this is according to Rob Walker, who is another Biden business associate. We also know spoke with Joe Biden and played golf with Joe Biden on multiple occasions. So that's that's the truth about Joe Biden's interactions with his son's business associates that he didn't. OK, he did not. Today. OK, James Lynch. But other than that, what evidence do you have? Yeah. So besides the testimony, besides the- <laughs> I'm just I'm just messing with you. <laughs> I'm just saying that's a huge that's a huge piece of evidence. Another name I didn't hear you mention, though, is Tony Bobolinsky. Uh, Bobolinsky has uh, laid all of this out. They, yeah. Obviously, he met with Joe. They, they had dinner together. Joe vetted Bobolinsky to establish that hey, he'd be a good business partner for the family. Yeah. So Bobolinsky told the FBI that he met with Joe Biden at a hotel in California in 2017 after Joe Biden had left the vice presidency. And Bob Alinsky told the FBI that he talked business with Joe Biden because of the potential uh, joint venture called Sinohawk, which is where the infamous uh, 10% for the big guy comes from. And we know this, we only know this officially because the FBI FD302 interview summary was released by the Ways and Means Committee in September, Yeah, thanks to the IRS whistleblowers. Also, uh, you mentioned Devin Archer. Devin Archer has produced a handwritten note from Joe Biden while he was vice president of the United States uh, a- a- apologizing to Devin for not getting his chance to talk to him at a luncheon that was being hosted for the Chinese president, who at the time. Yeah. Uh, and so, like, the idea, like, oh, I've never even met these guys, is it's absurd in every possible way you can measure it. Yeah, precisely. And uh, Devin Archer, the letter that Joe Biden wrote to Devin Archer was first shared by uh, Tucker Carlson when Archer interviewed Tucker Carlson. And Archer even mentioned that Joe Biden met with one of Hunter Biden's Chinese business associates named Jonathan Lee in Beijing for coffee. So that's that's just Joe Biden wasn't 
speaking with them on the phone or meeting with them in America. He was also meeting with them in foreign countries, according to Devin Archer. It's amazing. All right, so so yesterday you, you noted earlier that the IRS whistleblowers Gary Shapley and Joseph Ziegler met yet again with the House Ways and Means Committee. And the reason this is so important, that this particular uh, construction, James Lynch, is because because they are active IRS employees, they're not allowed by law to just share you know, what's going on with somebody's tax filings typically. But the one way they can do it is by communicating directly with the House Ways and Means Committee, which is allowed to take this kind of testimony on this on this intimate tax data. And uh, when they they revealed some stuff yesterday to include what you mentioned just a moment ago, which is that Joe Biden seemed to be in constant contact with these Biden family uh business partners and he was using his pseudonyms these are these are email addresses that he had that were not joseph biden they were just all these different names yeah so we know that joe biden was using one of his pseudonyms called robin ware to communicate with eric schwerin who is formerly a close friend and business associate of hunter biden's and we specifically know that the communications happened in spring of 2014 around the time joe biden went to ukraine in june of 2014 which took place only a couple months after Hunter Biden was appointed to a Burisma's board. A Burisma paid Hunter Biden more than $80,000 per month as a board member, even though he didn't have any experience in Ukraine. But at the time, his father was leading the Obama administration's Ukraine policy. And apparently, uh, Joe Biden was also communicating with Hunter Biden's business associate, Eric Schwerin, by using an unsecured uh, alias. And in this case, it was Robin Ware. Huh. And and you you say that most of the communications that were released yesterday, or, or at least the what we know about the communications, most of that occurred around the Ukraine deal, like around the firing of Viktor Shokin? Yeah, we don't know specifically what the communications say. We just have a document from the IRS whistleblowers that has email metadata showing Joe Biden communicated with Eric Schwerin on specific dates. But we do know that uh, Shokin was eventually fired, and Joe Biden has said publicly that he pressured Ukraine into getting Shokin fired. And uh, Shokin appeared to be investigating uh, Burisma at the time for alleged corruption. But I, we cannot confirm or deny whether Shokin was the subject of any of the emails with Schwerin. Right. We, don't, we haven't seen the contents of the email. We just know there's a lot of activity, uh, a lot of emails being sent around the time of Shokin's firing. Uh, this was before Shokin's firing, mm-hmm. but but perhaps they might have talked about it. It's hard to say, especially because there was a prosecutor who was in there before Shokin took over the job. Okay. Uh, Got it. But according, according to Fox News, the whistleblowers would have needed a search warrant to, to obtain the contents of the emails themselves. And we know from the whistleblower testimony that certain efforts to get search warrants related to the Hunter Biden investigation were stonewalled by uh, Department of Justice officials, specifically U.S. Attorney or Assistant U.S. Attorney Leslie Wolf for the District of Delaware. So it's hard yes. to say that if they pursue the so, search warrant, they be able to get it. On, on that front, Leslie Wolf, what can you tell us, James, about the likeliness that she's going to testify at any point in the near term? Yeah, so uh, Jim Jordan subpoenaed Leslie Wolf to testify later this month. Uh, the subpoena happened in late November, and we'll see if Wolf is able to testify. David Weiss, the special counsel in the Hunter Biden case, and a bunch of other Department of Justice officials have testified before the House Judiciary Committee and discussed their alleged conduct in the Hunter Biden investigation. The testimonies have confirmed some of the key allegations brought forward by the whistleblowers, but Weiss and Attorney General Garland both did not really discuss any of the specific allegations against Wolf no. when they testified. No, in fact, if I recall correctly, I think Merrick Garland was suggesting that even invoking her name was bringing threats upon her, that it was dangerous to mention this this poor assistant U.S. attorney. Yeah, Garland, when he testified in September, claimed that there were threats being made against Leslie Wolf. I don't really know much about that, but uh, Wolf is obviously a, a central figure to the Hunter Biden investigation. The whistleblowers have testified that Wolf, presented, uh, Wolf prevented a search warrant from including Joe Biden, who she referred to as political figure one. And this was backed up by a document that they released in September. We also know that Wolf 
appeared to stonewall an effort to search Hunter Biden's storage locker in Virginia, which investigators believe contained evidence relevant to the Hunter Biden case. So Wolf will definitely have a lot to answer for when she testifies. Yes. And didn't she also author the plea deal that was used uh, that that was attempted uh, to to get Hunter Biden off scot free from any meaningful charges? Yes. So um, media outlets have reported that Wolf played a central role in the plea deal that would have given Hunter Biden prosecutorial immunity related to his conduct with Burisma and with China. And we also know that Wolf's name has not appeared on any of the court documents related to the Hunter Biden case, even though she appeared to be working on the case only weeks before the initial charges were brought against Hunter Biden. But we don't know the reasoning for that. We don't know what's going on internally. So, so, so isn't this bizarre? I mean, for any number of reasons. But one is like if you're a like a, a U.S. attorney or an assistant U.S. attorney, wouldn't you want your name on the documents showing this is a pretty high profile thing? You're going after the the son of a major political figure. You're demonstrating no man is above the law. You're doing this prosecution. Uh, her her fingerprints are not on, on any of this. Her, her name's not on it. And yet she's the guiding force behind so much of the effort to how they handle Hunter Biden, apparently. Yeah. And we know that Wolf conducted a lot of work on the case over the period of years when uh, the Delaware office really took control of the investigation. So it is pretty strange why her name is not on any of the court documents. So we, again, we don't really know the answer to that question yet. Got it. And uh, David Weiss didn't really talk specifically about Wolf aside from defending her integrity. There, there was some drama today as it relates to Hunter Biden's potential testimony before the United States Congress. Most Americans, if they received a subpoena to appear before Congress, is not really an optional thing. Uh, but Hunter Biden's attorneys seem to think it's entirely optional. What's happening right now, James? Yes. So Hunter Biden's attorney, Abby Lowell, he wrote a letter recently proposing that Hunter Biden skip a closed door deposition that the Oversight Committee uh, subpoenaed him to appear for. Instead, Lowell suggested that Hunter Biden should simply testify publicly. And James Comer and then Jim Jordan and Jason Smith who were leading the impeachment inquiry into President Biden. They rejected Hunter Biden's request and they told him to come for the deposition to testify. And today, Comer and Jordan both threatened to hold Hunter Biden in contempt of Congress if he defies the subpoena and refuses to appear for the closed door session. And that would be on the 13th. That's what they've scheduled it for. Yes, they've scheduled it for December 13th. It's we'll see what Hunter Biden's attorney says in response to the threat to hold him in contempt. We know that Comer also threatened to hold FBI Director Ray in contempt when the FBI was reluctant to show lawmakers the FD-1023 form containing the Biden bribery allegation. Uh, the, the lawmakers eventually were able to view that form. So Comer has threatened, subpoena, threatened yes. to hold somebody in contempt before, and now he's doing it again with Hunter Biden. Okay. Uh, lastly, if I could, I, I request a, a news story from you. Uh, this is unusual, but I wanted to do this. Would you ask the Department of Justice whether they would prosecute a contempt of Congress charge against Hunter Biden should they receive one? Yeah, I think it's hard to say whether what the DOJ will do, but we we do know that uh, Biden appointed U.S. attorney for uh, Washington, D.C., Matthew Graves. He would probably be the one to handle that case. Yeah. And Graves previously refused to partner with Weiss on the Hunter Biden investigation, something that the IRS whistleblowers first brought to light and that Graves and both confirmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're going to obviously not comment to you, but. It's a good story anyway. They refused to say whether or not they would actually prosecute uh, Hunter. Yeah. And, and Vince, let me note that Joe Biden previously said that uh, people who defy subpoenas should be prosecuted, and this was related to the uh, January 6th committee. He did say that. Uh, actually, here is – let me see if I have it here. Actually, this is the audio of Joe Biden saying that very thing. He asked the president tonight, what is his response to this? What does he think of people who are defying these subpoenas, and should the Justice Department prosecute them? And this is what he told us. I hope that the committee goes after them and uh, holds them accountable. Should they be prosecuted by the I, Justice I do, Department? yes. Yes, says the president. He said he's, he says the Justice Department should prosecute his political opponents in that clip uh, for uh, failing to respond to congressional subpoenas. It's, it's amazing. It's a good reminder. Thank you very much for that. James Lynch over at The Daily Caller. Good to talk to you today, sir. In case you're wondering what the Biden administration thinks of black voters, uh, the Washington Post reports that 
they're delaying, they're trying to delay their ban on menthol cigarettes right now because they're afraid that black voters won't support them in the next election. So they want to wait to ban their favorite cigarette until after the election. They want to hurt them after the election. <laughs> this is, I mean, this is really the way they view the world. The Biden administration will further delay a long-awaited ban on menthol cigarettes after fierce lobbying from critics who warned that a prohibition could anger some black smokers who favor the products and could hurt President Biden's re-election prospects, administration officials said. The administration is expected to announce today that it plans in March to finalize federal rules that would lead to menthol cigarettes being removed from the market. The federal government decides, no, you're not allowed to smoke a flavored cigarette, so they're going to ban it from the market entirely. And now they realize that all of their political coalitions are falling apart at the moment. And they're thinking, well, how do we keep black voters? Well, don't ban their menthols until after the election. It's so ghoulish. The whole, th the whole thing. Uh, coming up, I've got... I actually have some interesting audio on that particular topic. Maybe I'll get to that. And uh, we've also got an update for you on Tommy Tuberville's fight to save lives. Biden administration spent a whole bunch of your money to kill babies. Tommy Tuberville's been trying to stop that. There's an update to that story. Good afternoon to you. 535 here at News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. You can join us at 888-630-9625, 630 wmal I told you moments ago about the Biden administration tapping the brakes on banning menthol-flavored cigarettes because they're afraid black voters will hold them accountable for doing that. So they said they'll they'll do the ban after the election. You know, they'll save the suffering for then. This is what a couple of years ago when when the Biden administration announced all this. Here's how it was covered by uh, KPIX. They interviewed. Some black smokers about what they thought on this subject. Including this man in Oakland named Reggie, who says he's tired of white politicians deciding what's best for black adults. We, we're getting treated like we, we are really uh, kids. Because they're telling us what we can't buy and what we should buy. He's not wrong about this. He's not. That's it, right? Don't you, feel, you feel patriotic. You're like, get out of here. It's not an endorsement. It's not a full-throated endorsement of smoking, at least. <laughs> but yeah, some people like smoking. But they're adults. They're adults. And here you have the government come in and you can't take that cigarette out of your hands. And they're not banning all cigarettes. They're not banning all cigarettes. They're banning one specific type. One. Menthols. That's it. <laughs> so it's it's a pretty it's a pretty clear target. And and among menthol cigarette buyers, I believe the numbers are like 85% are black Americans who who smoke menthols. And so the Biden administration is specifically targeting. And now remember that the, the rationale is like, oh, well, we're doing this to help you. It's always, you know, they rob you of liberty to help you. That's, that's the plan. But Reggie's got it right. Reggie's like, this is insane. What, you're not my dad. I can make a decision whether I buy a menthol or not. Deciding what's best for black adults. We, we're getting treated like we, we are um, really uh, kids. Because they're telling us what we can't buy and what we should buy. How can you tell a grown man anything about what he should buy with Damn his money? Straight, if you want a cigarette, let him have a cigarette. There are plenty of contradictions. Regular tobacco will still be legal, and despite multi-million dollar anti-smoking campaigns, smoke shops are considered essential businesses during the pandemic. Yeah, remember this? And Jarrett Whitmore works at a cannabis shop that sells the same flavors that are now being banned in tobacco products. Before all these vaporizer cigarette flavors, there was only regular and menthol. So I think they just picked it because it was a flavor and, and it got lumped into the list because it was a flavor. And like I said, I think that's overstepping a little bit. Smoke shop owners were reluctant to go on camera, but fear what will happen to their businesses, especially in black neighborhoods, where high demand could drive sales underground and create an illegal market for menthol tobacco. Insanity. Just insanity. So yeah, and small businesses too get wild by this. So nobody, nobody really advantage is, uh, derives an advantage from this. Liberty's gone. Yep. Anyway, so they're saving it. They're like, this is that that particular form of tyranny won't take place until after the election. <laughs> That's the plan. Amazing. What does it take to get busted for carjacking in Washington D.C.? Do you know the answer to that? There's a lot of carjacking going on in D.C. Well, we've discovered what the answer is: carjacking an FBI agent. 
Yeah, the update on this uh, FBI agent who was carjacked in Washington, D.C. last Wednesday. Uh, now, a 17-year-old by the name of Devante Lynch was just arrested this week. Court documents, according to Daniel Hamburg over at D.C. News Now, court documents say he knocked the agent to the ground, pointed a gun at her, and then drove off with another suspect in the passenger seat. Documents say that the D.C. Police Department found FBI ammunition in Devante Lynch's home. The second suspect remains at large. But this is, remember this story? We had a story uh, about a month ago. A girl who was carjacked, and she had an Apple AirTag in her car. This is what the mayor's handing out now. She had an Apple AirTag in her car. And so when the police responded to the carjacking, she said, she, she held up her phone and she said, look, I've got an AirTag. I know exactly where the car is. And the cops said, sorry, we can't chase. We, we're not allowed to chase anymore, so we'll just have, we'll sit here together while I'll watch the phone. <laughs> Nothing. So, so the poor girl had her car stolen. She had a tracker. The co cops couldn't give chase. Here, an FBI agent gets carjacked. Whoa, wait a second now. Easy. When it, regular citizens? Yeah, yeah, okay. The, yeah, you can carjack them. FBI agents? Now you've overstepped the boundaries here. Now you've, now you've done it. And so 17-year-old Devante Lynch is looking at some... Real hard time now for fine, for going after an FBI agent. Just pick the wrong car to steal. Wrong car to steal. Normal citizens, well, you're on your own. FBI agents, don't you worry. We'll track that car down. We'll, we'll get to it. That's that's crazy. That's uh, that's also going on in the city uh, today inside of uh, Washington, D.C. Another big thing that happened yesterday that uh, I wanted to get to, we had a lot of congressional hearings yesterday, so it was hard to get to all of this, but... By now, you may have heard that uh, many of the presidents of the top schools around our country, the top, these are supposed to be, you know, the Ivies. Or is, I think, is, is, does Chris Plant say this? Chris Plant has so many great sayings. He refers to the Ivies as the poison Ivies, <laughs> which is a great, if that's his, it's fantastic, Chris. One, add another one to your list. Um, Harvard, MIT, and the University of Pennsylvania, their presidents were all testifying yesterday. And Elise Stefanik wanted to know, whether or not calling for the genocide of Jews on campus would be a violation of the code of conduct. Now, one would presume that if you have a code of conduct on campus, calling for genocide might violate it. <laughs> if, if you're going to have a code of conduct at all, here's the way you will comport yourself while you are on our campus. Being a genocidal maniac, I would think, would trip every code of conduct in the country. You know, this is not, you're allowed to have free speech, but if you have a campus and you have a code of conduct, you know, maybe not calling for the genocide of your classmates is a good start. And here is uh, Elise Stefanik asking a simple question. MIT President Kathy Kornbluth, the first to go. Does M at MIT, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate MIT's code of conduct or rules regarding bullying and harassment, yes or no? If targeted at individuals not making public statements. Yes or no? Call so would a Klan rally be okay on MIT's campus? Like if bunch of people donned hoods and were marching around, torches and all sorts of awful things. Would that be uh, fine? Is it, would, would, would that violate the code of conduct if the students were doing that? These, uh, these presidents are unbelievable, these college presidents. And I, and I love, I, again, once again, you see all these lefties. There's some lefties are online today. That, I can't believe this is happening on college campuses. You did this. You built this environment. This is, like, the tolerance for bigotry has been out of control. Individuals not making public statements. Yes or no? Calling for the genocide of Jews does have, not constitute bullying and harassment? I have not heard calling for the genocide for Jews on our campus. But you, it's not even really the tolerance of bigotry. It's the encouragement of bigotry that these universities are guilty of. Heard chants for intifada. I've heard chants, which can be anti-Semitic depending on the context, when calling for the elimination of the Jewish people. What? So those would not be according to the MIT's code of conduct or rules. When you wait, did you hear what she just said? When you call for the elimination of the Jewish people, um, we need to assess the context of your call. <laughs> well, I would presume that the call would be that you are, you know, the the context is that you're calling for the elimination of the Jewish people. It it's not a citation. It's not like you're mentioning like, hey, some other person once said this. If it's it's you actively saying. I guess what, who, should, who we should eliminate. That would be um, investigated of, as harassment if pervasive and severe. Pervasive. 
says the MIT president. Okay, Penn president Liz McGill also asked by this about this by Stefanik. Ms. McGill, at Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? If the speech turns into conduct, it can be harassment, yes. I am asking, specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. It's a context-dependent decision. That's your testimony today. Calling for the genocide of Jews is depending upon the context. That is not bullying or harassment. This is the easiest question to answer <laughs> yes, Ms. Easy, McGill. It is kind of easy, isn't it? It's a layup. It's, uh, so is your testimony it, that it, you will not answer yes? If it... Uh, is if the, yes speech or no. becomes, if the speech becomes conduct, it can be harassment, yes. Conduct meaning committing the act of genocide? The speech is not harassment? This is unacceptable, Ms. McGill. I'm gonna give you one more opportunity for the world to see your answer. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's code of conduct when it comes to bullying and harassment? Yes or no? It can be harassment. The answer is yes. Huh. This is, isn't this weird? This is, I mean, like the, the hemming and the hawing. We need more context before we can really establish whether or not it would violate the code of conduct. The code of conduct. There are universities, like, you know, there, there are universities who will punish kids for getting in trouble when they go back home. You know, if you, if you get busted by the cops or whatever. And you can be thrown out of university for your conduct in some other jurisdiction, even if it doesn't involve the school. And here, here they're like, hmm, I'm going to need to see an example before I render a judgment on this particular one. Here's Harvard President Claudine Gay, who uh, has been – Harvard University has been scrubbing her – apparently all of her statements from during the George Floyd riots. She had posted letters about how the the community is – is hurt by what's going on right now, and we stand with our black brothers and sisters, and on and on and on. And uh, for whatever reason, Harvard in the last 24 hours has been erasing all of this from their website ever since this congressional hearing yesterday. Here's Harvard President Claudine Gay uh, answering in the same way as the MIT president and the Penn president. And Dr. Gay, at Harvard, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. What's the context? Targeted as an individual, targeted as, at an individual. It's Do targeted at Jewish that? students, Jewish individuals. Do you understand your testimony is dehumanizing them? Do you understand that dehumanization is part of antisemitism? I will ask you one more time. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment? Yes or no? Anti-Semitic rhetoric. When it and is it anti-Semitic rhetoric? Anti-Semitic rhetoric when it crosses into conduct that amounts to bullying, harassment, intimidation. You know, the litmus test for this would be to ask the question, if you have students calling for the genocide of black people, that would be the that would be the litmus test, right? That would be that, honestly, you could throw it right in their face. If you had students calling for the genocide of black people, would that constitute a violation of your code of conduct? And do you think they'd answer the same way? If that was, I mean, presumably, like if you asked them back to back, they would just to maintain some sort of consistency. But if that was asked independently, do you think the Harvard president would answer the same way? Like, well, I'd have to see the context, and uh, we got to figure out how many individuals were targeted here, and blah 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 blah. Like, no, there's no way in hell, no, not a chance. The bullying harassment, intimidation, that is actionable conduct, and we do take action. So the answer is yes, that calling for the genocide of Jews violates Harvard Code of Conduct, correct? Again, it depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. The answer is yes, and this is why you should resign. These are unacceptable answers across the board. So uh, that's that was happening in Congress yesterday, in case you're wondering how screwed up our higher education system is, if you can call it that. Uh, that education system has produced some real doozies. Over at the White House, they have interns. 
You familiar with the White House internship program? Of course, everyone's familiar with that. It's uh, it's been abused in in the past. Uh, the White House interns are demanding a Middle East ceasefire in a letter to Biden. NBC News has a report that the interns, those brave souls, have gathered together and signed an anonymous letter calling on Joe Biden to stop helping Israel. The interns, you might call it an intern fada. They've they've decided that they are opposed to Israel and they'd like Joe Biden to be as well. Dateline Washington, a group of White House interns joined the growing list of administration officials. Okay, a White House intern is not a quote administration official. That that is a very generous, generous label for a White House intern. <laughs> just, just shut up, that, right? The kid, like, hey, will you please? The coffee's getting cold. Would you go get out of here? You're not even supposed to be in here right now. We're talking about adult stuff. A group of White House interns joined the growing list of administration officials applying internal pressure to President Joe Biden to call for a permanent ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, sending him a letter late Tuesday that accuses him of having ignored the, quote, pleas of the American people. The letter, first shared with NBC News and addressed to Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, is supported by more than 40 interns, 40 of them altogether, who worked in the White House and other executive branch offices, according to the text. Quote, we, the undersigned, fall 2023 White House and executive office of the president interns will no longer remain silent on the ongoing genocide of the Palestinian people, the interns wrote. Of course, anonymously. <laughs> we will no longer remain silent, except you won't know our names. In the aftermath of Hamas's brutal October 7th terrorist assault, NBC writes, and with the group still holding hostages, Israel has mounted a ferocious counterattack that has killed thousands of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and driven many more from their homes. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby recently said that the word genocide is being thrown away in a pretty in a, thrown around that is in a pretty inappropriate way, and that it is Hamas, not Israel, that is pursuing the eradication of an entire people. Well, that's true. That's true. Uh, the interns wrote this, quote, we heed the voices of the American people and we call on the administration to demand a permanent ceasefire. We are not the decision makers of today, but we aspire to be the leaders of tomorrow, comma, barf, comma. And we will never forget how the pleas of the American people have been heard and thus far ignored. Boy, if, is there any White House that deserves this more than the Biden White House? <laughs> the, the interns are staging a revolution right now. The left has created all of this. They really have. So these kids popped out of the left brainwashing factory. They ended up at the White House, and they think that they can call the shots on U.S. policy. And they say, stop helping Israel out. The intern Fada has reached the White House. Right, let's check in on the phones. We got Ron calling in from Aldi Line 3. Ron, you're on the Vince Galanay Show. Hey, good evening, sir. Thank you for taking my call. So two things. Thing one. If I heard you correctly, when you read the letter yeah. from the interns, yeah. it started with "We the undersigned" and nobody signed. It. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, it's a lie. <laughs> thing, thing two, just well, just to show the blissful ignorance of so many of today's youth. And thing two, when people say "not in this context," like the lady did yesterday, or KJB did, or KBJ, whatever. Yeah. Why don't anybody? Why don't anybody ever follow up with it? Well, give me a context where it does apply. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, actually, to St Stefanik's credit, I don't think we may, we played it in the audio, but she did ask something to the effect of like, oh, so they'd actually have to start committing a genocide before you would hold them accountable? It's like, it's so preposterous on its face, but uh, excellent point, Ron. You gotta really, when they start squirming, uh, you know, just keep on tugging on that thread. Let the world see what they really believe. I, I uh, You know who I like, who I believe? The great one, Mark Levin. He's up next right here on WML.